I'm in debt. I have two car payments, four years into a 30-year mortgage, balances on a couple credit cards, plus college for three kids on the horizon. Zero savings. I work long hours at a job that I hate. And despite all that, all I get is stress about how I can make more money. I take four pills at night for my back pain. Some days, getting up seems like too much. I struggle with dyslexia. I have high cholesterol. I overeat a little too often. I'm trying to get in shape. But it's never, I mean never enough. My dad died five years ago from cancer. I should have seen him more before he passed. Man, I miss him so much. Everyone expects me to be over it. But it's something that I still deal with daily. I haven't taken my wife on a date in four months. I practically forgot our anniversary. My kids need me when I get home. But it's late, and I want to sleep. I spend my weekends at their functions, as if that's enough. All this, and I still resent my family. Because I have no time just for me! I can be amazingly selfish. I'm often angry, seemingly, for no reason. I struggle with lustful thoughts, none of which my wife understands. Nor do I, for that matter. I'm good at some things, I'm great at nothing. I had dreams for my work and my family, and I abandoned them long ago. I think I'm a realist, and I come off as a pessimist. I feel restless knowing something is missing. I have too many burdens. They're suffocating. And this is the weight I carry. Mm-hmm. Well, good morning, church. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord, amen? Today we're finishing up our message series called Emotions, and uh, we've been looking at some of the emotions that Jesus encountered and expressed. And the Bible scholars suggest that as we look at Jesus throughout the four gospel accounts of Scripture, that we can actually identify he displayed 39 different emotions. Jesus was real. He felt things at a deep level, and his emotions can help us center our emotions so that we can respond rather than react when we find ourselves in those emotional places. So let me give you a quick wrap up. In week one, we talked about uh, how Jesus sees you and knows you and loves you, that Jesus would cross lines and break rules to be there for and with people and show love and grace. In week two, we talked about anxiety and how Jesus found relief for anxiety that he experienced by talking to his friends, talking to his heavenly father, and talking to his feelings. And then last week we talked about anger, and that anger in and of itself is not a sin, but it so often can lead us down the destructive path of sin. And so we learned a little more about how to be angry like Jesus and to use that emotion for good rather than evil. And today, I want to look at an emotion that a lot of people don't think of uh, when we think about Jesus. I want to look at the sadness of Jesus. What kind of things make him sad, and what is it that brings him joy, and how can we experience true joy in Jesus? So throughout the Gospels, we see so many things that brought Jesus joy. Whenever the hurting were healed, he was full of joy. Whenever the rejected were loved, he was full of joy. Whenever sinners were forgiven, uh, he rejoiced with the angels in heaven. He was full of joy. But occasionally, Jesus would cry. Occasionally, he was sad. For example, we see in Luke 19, verse 41, uh, Scripture says this, As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. Why did he cry? Let's remember why Jesus came. Jesus came to bring life and life more abundantly. He came to seek and save the lost. He came to proclaim the good news to the poor, uh, recovery to the sight of the blind. Jesus came to set prisoners free. He didn't come for the righteous. He came for the sinners. He didn't come for the healthy. He came for the sick. Jesus came to show the love of his Father in heaven. And what was it that made Jesus cry? Well, he looked over Jerusalem and what he saw wrecked him. And so he cries out in Matthew 23, 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, yet you were not willing. 
How often uh, I wanted just to bring you close, just to show you my love, to comfort you, to tell you how much you matter to me. Uh, But it makes me so sad because I wanted to love you, uh, but you wouldn't let me. So what is it that makes Jesus sad? When he, it's when he wants to love and protect and comfort and heal and be with you, but he can't. And why can't he? Because you are not willing. So I want to pack that thought a little bit more by looking at a story that Jesus shares with us about a father and two sons. And you're likely familiar with the story from Luke chapter 15, so I'm not going to read it from the scripture, but let me just tell you about it. So Jesus tells us this story about this father and these two sons. And one day the younger son tells his dad, Dad, I'm done. I want my inheritance. I'm out. Now, I have to imagine that this boy didn't just one fine day decide to say this. Because especially in this culture, when you tell your father, hey, guess what, I'm done and I want my inheritance, give me what's owed to me, that is considered very, very disrespectful. And that son is basically telling the father, I wish you were dead. And we don't really know anything about what's going on in his life. Maybe maybe he felt restricted. Maybe he felt like uh, he wasn't able to be all uh, that he wanted to be, or maybe there were too many things that he didn't like, or maybe he was just a teenager who couldn't wait to get out from under his parents. But we can speculate that the son is being very arrogant in his rebellion. And we have to wonder what was going on in his heart that put him in that place where he felt like he could be that disrespectful to his father. And what's interesting to me is the father says, okay, and he gives him his inheritance. And so the story goes, the son leaves the house and he's loaded, he's got money, he's partying, he's enjoying life, there's nothing stopping him. And we can imagine uh, that he's got all sorts of new friends because that's what happens when you're throwing out money left and right. Everybody is your best friend. And uh, it's interesting but not surprising that the son squanders it all. He parties so hard that he loses everything. And scripture says this, uh, after he lost everything, uh, that there was a severe famine in the land, and that was when he began to be in need. So he had no money. When his runny ran out, his so-called friends all left. And he goes and he finds a job with one of the local farmers, and his job is to go into the fields and to feed the pigs. And he's so desperate that he's looking at the food that he's feeding to the pigs, and he's thinking, this looks pretty good. I wish I could eat some of this. That's how hungry and how desperate he was. So have you ever been in a situation where uh, you didn't intentionally drift that far, but you still ended up that far? I mean, if I, if I put myself in his place, uh, the place of the younger son, I don't think he thought, I'm going to get all this money, and then I'm going to end up feeding pigs somewhere, right? He probably thought, he's going to enjoy life. He's going to be able to do everything he wanted to do. He had a plan. He had a goal. But nothing happened the way he thought it would happen. Have you ever been in a place like that where life just does not go as you had planned? Let's take it a step further. Uh, We come to find out in the story that the Father is a representation of God, our Heavenly Father. So let me ask you this. Have you ever drifted to where not only have you gone off track in your life, but your relationship with God is also suffering because of it? This young son, he, he made mistake after mistake, and he found himself completely lost. He found himself destroyed. He had nothing to look forward to. And here's this young man standing in a pig's pen wondering if the pig's food was good enough to eat. Now look, there are situations in life where we get so rock bottom that the worst thing almost looks tempting, right? And I can promise you that your enemy, the devil, loves to work in those situations. He loves to work on your mind in times like that and keep you uh, stuck right there at the bottom. But in Luke uh, chapter 15, verse 17, a powerful moment happens. This is what Jesus says, verse 17. When he came to his senses, he said, 
How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. He said when the boy came to his senses, well, that meant he wasn't seeing things in the right mind. You see, our enemy, the devil, likes to drag our minds into places God never meant for us to go. But then he came to his senses, and it was then that he realizes, oh my goodness, life is better with my father. He knew he'd messed up. He knew that he hurt his father. He knew that there was a possibility that that relationship could never be repaired, but he didn't let that stop him. And we need to see the power in that decision because the sad reality is that so many of God's people get to a place where they are so lost and so broken that they think that the mistakes that they've made, that the decisions that they've had to take in life, that all of those were just too bad and that there is no way that that could ever uh, be repaired. And so they end up doing things that make their situations even worse. But as Jesus is telling the story, he paints a picture where he says the boy finally came to his senses. And he says, what if I go back home? So verse 20, it says, he got up and went to his father. And now when we talk about finding true joy in Jesus, the first thing that we need to see is that it starts with taking one step towards the father. One step. This boy decided that he needed to go home, so he takes one step, and he starts out for home. And scripture says, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him, and he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And you got to love that picture, right? Right? Here's the son thinking, you know what, I've messed up so much, there's no way my father would accept me. And he's got his apology speech all planned out, and he's probably practicing it on the way, and he's thinking, you know what, I'll just ask my dad, like, can I just stay here as one of the servants? Like, let me just work for you. Like, I don't expect to be back in the position that I was in. I don't expect for you to take me back as your son, but at least let me be in your home. Let me be one of your servants. And here you see the picture of what Jesus is trying to help us understand. He's saying, this is a picture of our heavenly father. When the son was walking home, the father sees him and he's so excited that he runs to him. And when he gets to his son, he hugs him and he kisses him. And he's so exciting that his son that that he thought was dead is still alive. And he doesn't stop there. He says, you know what? Get my best robe. Get my ring, get my sandals, uh, because I'm going to cover this boy. I'm going to cover his mess. Everything that he thought was not repairable, I'm going to cover it. The father says, I'm going to redeem it. And I love this picture because Jesus is telling us that we don't have to clean up our mess before we come to him. He says, just come as you are. That's good stuff. We serve a good God. When the father is so elated, he's celebrating and he tells the people in his home, he says, you know what? Uh, We need to celebrate this moment. We need to have a party because I am no longer sad. My son isn't dead. He's alive. And, And this is a picture that Jesus is sharing with us of when one person returns back to God, when one person says, you know what? I'm a sinner. I messed up. God, I know I don't deserve this. I know I'm not worthy of this, but I'm coming back to you. And all of heaven is rejoicing when that moment happens so this father who's thrilled throws this party for his son who's returned home now remember there were two sons so the older son is on his way home he's coming from the field and he hears the music he hears the party and he's like what in the world is happening and so verse 26 says this so he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Like, hey, your dad's throwing a party because your brother isn't dead and he's home. And you would think that the older son would be excited, that he would be as thrilled as the father was because his brother is home. But he's not. Verse 28, the older brother became angry and refused to go in. 
So his father went out and pleaded with him. Now we have to wonder if there was some sibling rivalry going on there, right? Because of the response is not a response that you would expect. You've got one son that left home and didn't want to have anything to do with his father. He repented and came home. And then you've got the older son that technically was still physically at home. But I wonder how distant his heart was. He didn't care that his brother was alive. He didn't share the same feelings that his father shared, which makes me wonder what was really going on in the brother's heart. One son was physically distancing himself from the father, and the second son was emotionally distancing himself. And it's easy to look at the older brother and think, well, he's just a bad brother. But if we can be vulnerable for a moment... I mean, like, haven't we, in some ways, done what the older brother has done? Because he was with the father. He wasn't going hungry. He wasn't in, in any kind of lack, even in the midst of a famine. He was just fine, living in and enjoying all the benefits of his father's house. And here is the question. If we were to be honest and vulnerable, we have to ask, are we who dwell in the house of the father missing something to. I mean, you know, uh, maybe you come to church every week, you faithfully attend, you read your Bible, but is it truly a relationship with God that you are enjoying, or is it just becoming more of a routine or an obligation? Are you just checking off the list? Because the second point is this, in order for us to experience true joy with Christ, we need to enjoy a relationship instead of just an obligation, because it's not about obligation or even rules with Jesus. It's never been about that. And that's what Jesus is trying to help us understand. Uh, this father, he loved the rebellious son, but he also loved the rule-following son. He loved them both the same. And the father is saying, hey, my son, your brother who was once lost, who we thought was dead, is now back home. And he says to the other brother in verse 31, my son, uh, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he's found. And here, this older son is complaining, oh, well, my father never threw a party for me. Like, I've been here. I've been doing everything that I was supposed to do. You've never done anything like that for me. And the father says, but everything I have is yours. You underestimate your value. You underestimate who you are. You are my son, and everything I have is yours. The truth is that so many times people view following Jesus as a set of rules and obligations that they have to abide by. And when we look at it that way, we're missing it. We're missing the point. And God, please forbid that any one of us would end up like that older brother thinking, well, I've checked all the boxes. I've followed all the rules. I've done everything right. Because that's not what this is all about. It's about a relationship with our Heavenly Father. And when we have a true relationship with Him, that is when we experience joy, yes? Yes, sleepy 9 a.m. crowd. The thing that makes Jesus sad is when he wants to love on you and protect you and comfort and heal you and be with you and tell you how much you matter to him, but he can't because you are not willing. Let me just tell you that there is nothing more important than a for real relationship with Jesus. And if you don't find yourself experiencing true joy right now, let me tell you that it starts with taking one step back to the Father. It starts with realizing that it's not about the rules, it's all about the relationship. And the third way that we can experience true joy with God, with Jesus, is uh, by bringing people along with us. Sometimes I wish that I was there to watch this whole story unfold. 
Because I think, you know what, uh, that dad was pretty cool. His son came back after messing up big time, and he throws a party. He says, we're going to celebrate. Come on, get some beef, let's play some music, let's dance, let's do this. And the older son uh, comes home, and dad realizes, my son, you've been distancing yourself from me too in your heart. Can you just stop that? Can you just come in? Can you just realize that I love you too, that I'm here for you too? Now stop protesting, and let's just party. Because the father knew that when you celebrate things, you do it with other people. And having those people that you do life with come together and celebrate, there is power in that. And that helps us to truly enjoy moments like these. And the truth is we live in a season in our culture where being isolated seems natural. But we have to fight against it because we are not called to do life alone. We are called to recognize the goodness of God in our lives and to celebrate it. So look, we're going to start a new series of messages next week that will help us uh, pursue a greater level of relationship with Jesus. But your challenge for this week is to celebrate. Because the goodness of God is in your life. So church, what will you celebrate? Maybe you'll celebrate going back to school because each year is a rite of passage for your children and their teachers. Maybe this week you'll celebrate a special day, a birthday, an anniversary, a milestone day. Maybe you'll celebrate a win by your favorite sports team because that experience is something that creates a greater bond between you and the people you come together with to watch that game. Maybe you will simply celebrate the people you do life with. Whatever it is, celebrate it responsibly. <laughs> see the goodness in it. See, see the God in it. Throw some steaks on the grill. Put some music on and dance and give praise to the God who brings good things into your life and share his goodness with those around you. Take a step toward the Father. Enjoy true relationship with him and bring somebody to the celebration with you because we need each other and we need to come together and we need to celebrate. It matters and it makes a difference. So celebrate this week and come back next week ready to jump in to a new message series, excited about how we can grow closer and closer to Jesus through it all. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you and praise you for this day, for the opportunities that you give us today, for the opportunity that you give us to come into uh, this fellowship of faith, to be a part of uh, these people that we might do life together, that together we might celebrate the reality of your goodness and your grace in our lives. God, we are uh, emotional beings, and so often we are caught up on emotional roller coasters. The weight that we carry so often pulls us away from the things that you have called us to be about. I pray that you will help each and every one of us to uh, center our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts on you. To recognize things uh, are, are not going to change if I worry and worry and worry about them all night long. But it will change me if I worry and worry and worry about them all night long. God, I pray that you would help us to give those things to you. I pray that you would help us to uh, see the, the, the boundaries that we put in between you and us. The times when we um, bring condemnation on ourselves that says we're not good enough to be in the presence of God and help us to see the reality of your love and your grace that you uh, are not about those things but you are always there with your arms wide open saying come back. Here I am. Let's celebrate. God, I pray that you would just um, help us to see the importance of living our lives uh, with a very real relationship with you that you would help us to draw closer to you, that you would help us to recognize where and when you are at work, and that you would help us to just dig in deeper and deeper. And I pray for each and every one of us that you would put something on our hearts that you would want us to celebrate this week, that you would go before us and make the crooked places straight, that we might uh, do that celebration, that we wouldn't be concerned about uh, all the worldly things, 
but that we would just take that time apart and we would celebrate your goodness. Put that on each of our hearts this week. Help us to, uh, to take the time to focus and celebrate you. God, we just thank you and we praise you for all that you are and all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I don't know what the Lord is speaking to you today through this message, but your invitation is to identify what next steps he might be calling you to take. So maybe it's a, a conversation, maybe uh, it's a celebration, maybe it's a, a step uh, in the direction of something he's been speaking to you for a while, but you've pushed back against it. And today's the day you're going to say, oh, I'm going to stop pushing. I'm going to brace what it is God's calling me to do. I'm going to take that next step. Whatever it is, we would invite you to, uh, to reach out to us. Uh, if we can be of any kind of help to you, we'd be honored to walk with you, to pray with you, to celebrate with you, to do life with you, that together we might grow closer and closer to Jesus.